Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Prince from Portland State University, and I'm giving a very short overview of Native Americans of Old Portland. Um, I'm going to point you to some other resources so you can go exploring a bit more, but just to give you some visuals as you think about what images you'd like to see on the mural. Here in this image is my very favorite uh, photo of all of a Native American trader uh, sitting in Northwest Portland, showing baskets that she has woven, uh, click attack baskets that were made by people of the region, the Chin mostly Chinook people who were here in Portland. So um, here are the books that I've written. Um, uh, uh, Portland's Goose Hollow, I I'm a co-author on Portland Slab Town. My daughter and I wrote Notable Women of Portland and my Culture Wars and British Literature book. Um, so as I go through the slides, I often have the page numbers and the book that this information came from so that you can go to that source and read more for yourself. So where Portland stands today are the historic homelands of several bands of Chinook speaking people, including the Multnomah, the Clackamas and the Watlata Cascades villages. And there were also Kalapuya people of Tualatin villages of Kalapuya people on the Tualatin mountains. So where um, all the feeder area that feeds into Lincoln where our students go will have been in what was called Old Portland, which was from the river to the Tualatin Mountains. And later it began to expand. And I have images here showing some of the earliest illustrations of the Chinook people around the Portland region. Um, and the image with that's slightly blue tinted is of a traditional plank house um, that was uh, common in the Chinook style. And in front of the plank house um, are Chinook canoes and there's an animal effigy. And you'll see some evidence of that later on and uh, the baskets and uh, cradle board and the different types of images that were drawn by uh, European uh, explorers and missionaries and other folks who passed through the, through the region. So this is an image showing where the traditional language groups were before tribes were forced onto reservations in the 1850s. And here in Portland, that would be Chinook speaking people. And here's an, a map that was done by Lewis and Clark in 1805 when they passed the, through the region. And there are little triangles showing where there were uh, lodges of some kind, either a plank house like the one in the picture or smaller, temp more temporary lodges. Um, there were hundreds in this region and Lewis and Clark clearly show them on the maps. This plank house, is in Ridgefield, Washington, about a 35 minute drive from here. And it is used, it is built exactly on the site where there was a, a, a Chinook village in on the Washington side of the Columbia River. And the Chinook nation um, on the Wash in Washington use it for cultural purposes. It's a bit confusing, but the Chinook people that were in Portland would have been separate from the Chinook nation. The Chinook nation was more of the Chinook people that were up closer to Astoria, but on the Washington side. So in the 1850s, every tribe in Oregon was forced marched on their own particular trails of tears and eventually came to be these nine federally recognized tribes. Um, and so a lot of, of Oregon history books really start with a version of Manifest Destiny, which is that you know history only begins once the wagons start rolling across the prairies. And the stories are told in a way that erases native stories. And so what I've done is gone digging to try to uncover some of those native stories. I've read literally every mention of the word Indian in uh, er the earliest print, the uh, four decades of the Oregonian. And to try to understand what was happening here in Portland that didn't make the history books. And so um, I found an Oregonian article that talks about the 1850s. It's quoting a pioneer who moved to Portland um, then and describing early Portland as having 275 pioneers. And by that, they would mean there would be uh, Chinese Americans. There were black pioneers. Um, but uh, when he says that there were uh, 1000 uh, native people, it was shocking for me to see that native people outnumbered 
um, other residents of Portland four to one in 1850s Portland. This has not been in the history books. This is why I started adding it to every book I wrote after that, because I wanted uh, this really fascinating story to be uh, uh, conveyed. So this is an image of Cooch Lake. So what is now Old Town, Chinatown and the Pearl, which also feed into Lincoln High School was once covered in a lake and that was infilled over the years and all the creeks and gulches buried as real estate became more desirable. And there were 500 native people um, in an encampment around Cooch Lake and 500 around the Willamette River on Southwest Jefferson that this pioneer reports eyewitness view of in 1850. Um, and in the gulches uh, that were on the inner west side of what was old Portland, there was the Tanner Creek Gulch or a hollow, that's where Goose Hollow gets its name. And in the Johnson Creek Gulch, which once ran from Lovejoy to Raleigh, and uh, as you can see, both of them are quite huge. Uh, they both fed into Cooch Lake. Um, this is overlaid onto a later map just to show how big the gulches were, how much uh, moving of dirt it took to infill it. And where those stars were, were Chinese vegetable gardens, and also near there were Native American encampments. And the evidence I have throughout uh, both my Goose Hollow and Slaptown books. This is a zoom in on an 1879 illustration showing the growing city of Portland. And that's Burnside with the little V shape uh, where Alder uh, crosses and both Burnside and Alder are on 50 foot pilings over Tanner Creek Gulch. And uh, where Lincoln High School sits today is around where the C for Creek is. Um, and where the stadium sits today is where the word Tanner is. So the stadium was built into the natural amphitheater that was carved out by Tanner Creek. Um, in the, the Tanner Creek Gulch were uh, many Chinese vegetable gardens and native people living nearby trading daily with the uh, Chinese American farmers. So everyone who lived in uh, Oregon from uh, up until about the 1870s could not function without using Chinook jargon or Chinook Wawa. Native people called it the Wawa. Pioneers called it the jargon. It was not derogatory because it's a pidgin language, a trade language. It has about 500 words uh, using loan words from English, French, and several different native languages, including the Chinook people who were up and down the Columbia River and the Willamette. Uh, the black and white image is of an, uh, a dictionary that was in its um, 11th printing in the, 187, in the 1880s in Portland. It was used frequently by everyone who lived here. The Chinese vegetable gardeners used it to speak to the Native Americans. Uh, the pioneers spoke to each other uh, in Chinook jargon. And the on the uh, uh, other side is Chinook Wawa, which is the Grand Ron Dictionary showing um, uh, the language has not died. It was used as the daily language by the Grand Ron folks, mm -hmm. and they've put out a dictionary to uh, update it with uh, the way the language has changed for the Chinook, uh, for the Grand Ron. So I have had questions in the past about why do you say Chinook instead of Chinook? So I've put in this slide in the middle that shows uh, the uh, Chinook Nation quite clearly uh, set, shows how to pronounce it with a hard CH sound like in chin or chipmunk monk or church rather than a sh sound. This is a 1900 Edward Curtis photo uh, showing a tr Chinook canoe uh, going down the Columbia River. I have it in here to show that uh, the evidence is quite clear that Native people didn't go away, even when forced onto reservations. They returned many, many years to seasonal encampments to come and trade the baskets the women had made, the salmon the men had fished. This was a common part of old Portland. Here's a 1904 Oregonian illustration showing a Chinook canoe uh, with its quite striking um, animal effigy prow being used to unload freight off of the ships in the harbor. And this is back to the click attack baskets, one of my favorites. And we're uh, here we have a really important image. Um, in the middle is a Wasco Chinook basket collected by Lewis and Clark in 1805. 
They took it all the way back across the country. It ended up in Harvard's Peabody Museum. Pat Courtney Gold, who is Wasco Chinook and who was raised on the Warm Springs Reservation, was trying to revive uh, weaving th patterns that had been lost among tribal members. Some people knew how to collect the grasses. Some people knew how to start a basket. Some people knew how to finish, but it was starting to be lost cultural knowledge. And she went to Harvard Peabody Museum and said, can I, I'm Wasco, can I study this basket? And she studied the weaving pattern and style and the, the basket um, that's the more contemporary basket is made by uh, uh, Pat Courtney Gold, is also owned by the Harvard Peabody Museum and is an homage to that 1805 uh, Wasco basket. I think it's a really uh, incredible um, link, a cultural memory, a link to, um, uh, to show that cultures have not been lost um, and to the Chinook story of this region. And here's some uh, just general uh, pictures of Native American art of Oregon. It's another talk I give. I wanted to give just visually some of the iconography that you might have seen. Uh, we did not have totem poles in, in what is now Oregon. That was more Northern Washington and British Columbia and Alaska. But we had um, a robust uh, iconography that existed before the moment of European uh, colonization. Uh, there are over 20,000 petroglyphs in Oregon, and they tell quite a, a vibrant story. And I want to draw your attention to the Chinook canoes. That was on the grand opening of the Tillicum Bridge, where the uh, Grand Ron came for a ceremony. Tillicum means the people in Chinook jargon and is a very important way to acknowledge the Native story in Oregon. So here are the books if you want to go digging some more. Thanks.